Welcome to the AI and Faith Podcast. We are a community of expert technologists, professionals, and faith leaders bringing the ancient wisdom of the world's major religions to the ethics of artificial intelligence. Join us on this new journey and welcome to the conversation. My name is Pablo Andres Rosalmones, and I will be your host for today. This podcast is from an event in January 2024. In today's episode, Bishop Paul Ty from the Vatican's Dicastery for Culture and Education discussed the Vatican's involvement in the AI revolution, including their recent book, Encountering Artificial Intelligence. We also explored how the Church engages the global Catholic community regarding technological advancements, as well as international organizations. Our exploration also focused on elucidating how the teachings of the Church can act as guidance for scientists, entrepreneurs, policymakers, and congregations worldwide. Listen now to our conversation. Bishop Paul Tai was born in 1958, graduating from University College Dublin in 1979 with a degree in civil law. Having studied for the priesthood at Holy Cross College, Dublin, and as a Pontifical Irish College in Rome, he was ordained a priest of the Dublin Diocese in 1983. His first appointment was as parish chaplain and teacher in Valley Fermat. Subsequently, he studied moral theology at the Pontifical Gregorian University and in 1990 was a fellow lecturer in moral theology at the Master Day Institute of Education in Dublin and at Holy Cross College. He was appointed head of the theology department in 2000. In 2004, he was named as the director of the communications office of the Dublin Diocese. In 2005, he established the office for public affairs which aimed to promote the engagement of the diocese with public institutions and civic society. In November 2007, Pope Benedict XVI announced his appointment as Secretary of the Pontifical Council for Social Communications. He was appointed titular bishop of Rivestrum and adjunct secretary of the Pontifical Council for Culture by Pope Francis on 19th December 2015. Pope Francis nominated him secretary on 28th October 2017. So thank you. Thank you so much, Bishop. It's a true honor to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very happy and Pablo and looking forward to our conversation. So, and thank all the other people who are I'm spotting the names coming up here. So it's early in the morning for you. It's late evening for here. So we better make allowances for that too. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. And I think that everyone, well, I don't know if everyone, but many people I think will be very surprised about like the interest uh, that the church is showing regarding artificial intelligence. Uh, I certainly was the first time I heard about it. Um, I mean, it certainly was a surprise about this great interest that the church has in artificial intelligence. And I mean, the Pope himself has said uh, several things regarding AI and has addressed the topic uh, several times. So I was wondering if perhaps you can tell us a bit of why and how the church actually got involved in this topic. Yeah, I mean, there's the immediate ways in which the church got involved, and then there's the more long-term issue, which I think is the more important, the basic issue, that the church is in the world. Church is concerned about the things that are going to change and impact our world. Um, Our faith, our Christian faith, our Catholic belief system, does not give us an exemption from the world's problems. We live in this world, We journey in this world with other people. And Pope Francis in particular has been very strong on that. But we journey with other people and we need to share their journey. And a part of the journey of all human beings now is this reality of the emergence of science and technology in so many different ways that have made an extraordinary contribution to the well-being of our world that we, I think, appropriately want to celebrate, to celebrate the achievements of science and technology but not just the achievements in terms of the benefits that they give us, but also what they show us about the capacity of the human mind. We believe human beings are made in the image and likeness of God. So therefore, the flourishing of science is a testament to the wonder of the creation that we are, to our God-given capacities to reason, to discover, to expand our horizons of meaning. And that's, I think, something we have to be engaged with. I think we have to be very careful that we don't somehow have this idea of faith being something outside the world or something totally about a spiritual life that doesn't engage with human realities. So for an example, um, I think an important one would be to say for us is that we want to look at, say, the, the emergence now of AI. AI has a capacity to hugely 
impact our world. And the church wants to be part of the world's reflection on that. We won't have a unique voice. We may have a unique voice, but we won't be the only voice. We want to encourage people to reflect on how this emerging technology is going to impact our world, is going to impact us as people, impact us in our relationships. And we want to work with others to ensure that this, the extraordinary potential of AI will actually serve for human well-being, for the development of our world, for the creation of a better society for individuals and for all of us. So that's, I think, a concern that's part of our concern to be very much related to what is going to impact human well-being. And that's the background issue. The more immediate one is that the church has been part of um, coming to terms with what digital communications was doing, then became quite reflective on how digital communications were not just changing the world of communications, but were impacting our social lives, our cultural lives, our political lives, how um, political discourse has been changed by social media, for example. And increasingly a part of that as an awareness and attentiveness to how the what we might call digital culture was impacting our world, it became an awareness that something coming down the line was this new development called artificial intelligence. Not new, but are not newly called artificial intelligence, but a realization of the potential of something that was going to radically change our patterns of living together, our patterns of work, our patterns of forming relationships, and therefore something we have to think about and reflect. And that's, I think, why it'd be an interest. Then I have to say, many people who come to see the Pope, the that from the Secretary General of the United Nations to political leaders are saying to him, this is something we see as urgent for the future of our world. And we would like you to help us to reflect on and think about its importance and how it can be, how we need to think about it. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a kind of thing that we have to be interested in. Right. Now, and you just mentioned two things which I think are very important. You know, you mentioned working with others and you also provided these examples of different people from around the world that go and seek this uh, different advice and seek this collaboration, actually. And I think that this involvement is uh, actually made patent by the publishing of a recent book, Encountering Artificial Intelligence, uh, which we will talk a bit about that book in a moment. But can you tell us a bit what the, which I loved, by the way, it was, it was just a wonderful book. Um, but can you tell us a bit uh, what it is about and how this book actually came to be, like who's behind it, because I think it talks uh, greatly of this uh, collaboration and this working with others that you were just mentioning a, a moment ago. The origins of the book go back to conversations that have been happening here in the Vatican over a number of years, where some people coming from Silicon Valley, including some very senior figures, have come to discuss with the, they would say, the church, the Vatican, um, what is emerging, what's coming down the line, wanting to alert us to what was coming in terms of artificial intelligence and its likely impact, but also wanting to hear our perspectives on how it should be developed and how it should be, particularly with a concern about what are the ethical frameworks that should shape the development of AI. And in that context, we had many very good conversations. We have many local experts who helped us with those conversations, people with backgrounds in philosophy and in theology and in ethics. And I was kind of interested at the time in meeting maybe people, many of us of my age and my generation are not what you would call digital natives. And we know our ethical traditions, we know our philosophical traditions, but maybe we're not as quite as inserted in the more technical side of the debate. And I was convinced that I would find in the United States younger scholars who have that double competency, who are competent in the area of technology, but who also have the philosophical and theological training that allows them to move credibly between the two disciplines. So they can speak to the world of technology with credibility because they know that world and they know the technical developments. But they can also bring something new to that conversation because of their theological and philosophical training. We had planned in March 2020 to meet a group of scholars who would have been who were identified for us with the help of Santa Clara University and um, a cross selection of people from across North America. And the idea was to meet in March 2020 and to begin a process of reflecting on AI. And really, I was looking 
to try and pick the brains of those who I would see as having something particularly relevant to say. Obviously, COVID had other plans for us. So what was intended to be an in-person meeting became an online meeting. Fortunately, we had enough initial work in terms of preparatory text done that we developed three work streams over the following couple of years. One work stream, which focused very particularly on questions about consciousness of what it is that makes us human. Another work stream that focused on already an intuition we have that part of what makes us human is our capacity for relationships. And then another which tried to pick up on the specific ethical issues, social and ethical issues that were likely to be um, requiring attention as we focused on AI. And those work groups met basically on a basis of about once a month, sometimes bringing in other experts. And finally, we were able to come together in September of 2022. And what was amazing at that stage was a great kind of sense of we've done a lot of work, we've heard each other, we've learned from each other, we've brought in other scholars to help us at times, but really maybe we need to bring this together. There was never a plan at the beginning to produce a book, but the book emerged as in a said, this is something we should do to show the fruits of our discussions, to share the fruits of that discussion with others. And I think the hallmark of everything we did was that the, it's fair to say the book, the publication is born of dialogue and our desire was as best we can to make sure that it would promote further dialogue because the issue about the AI and the future of AI is essentially, it's, it's going to impact globally. The issues we're going to have to address are going to be, have to be addressed globally. They're going to have to require the insights of different political systems, different religious traditions and non-different philosophical approaches. And we need to reflect how AI is going to impact our world, but bringing an encouraging the voices of all those who have concerns about that issue to come together. So this is offering, in the first place, some of our perspectives that are coming out of a Christian Catholic viewpoint, that we think it will be perfectly accessible to people who don't necessarily belong to that tradition, but we would like them to engage with us, to debate with us, so that as a human race, we empower people to begin to think and take ownership of the future of AI, rather than simply waiting for others to make the decisions for them. I love that. I love like this, this uh, proactive approach that you're talking about, uh, taking responsibility for this future, how we want that future to be. And and certainly when you were mentioning that, uh, you know, this, this precisely this collaboration and uh, getting people f that are both knowledgeable in terms of technology, but also with the, uh, in terms of theology and philosophy and with all these different backgrounds, I think that the book clearly shows that. I mean, um, as I said, I've read it and I love it. I think it's a it's a it's a wonderful book. I think it's incredibly thought provoking. And for example, I was just remembering that the the way in which the terms regarding artificial intelligence are defined at the beginning, such as machine learning, deep learning, and all these different things, like clearly show that there's a deep understanding of both sides of the um, of the spectrum, or different sides of this uh, wonderful reality that come together to to um, that came together to create this book. I think it's 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 perfect. Now, one thing that uh, caught my eye when I first started reading it and that it's something that it's actually a topic that you talk throughout in the book, you know, that it's it's present in the book, that is, it's encountering artificial intelligence. Because I remember a conversation we actually have here with Noreen Hersfeld, who's here and who was also part of that book. So I remember that conversation that we had with her regarding what it means to have all these different relationships. And, you know, so the, so the title immediately uh, caught my eye. And there's uh, here's one statement uh, from the book, which perhaps we can um help us elucidate and bring a bit of light into that statement, which is uh, persons live personally by living interpersonally. So doing, they image God. This is a theological ground for the concept of encounter. Can you tell us a bit more about what that means and about the title of the book? Pope Francis uses the word encounter very frequently, and that's probably where, why we felt we needed to, to use that idea. Pope Francis has an understanding that as human beings, and this is not unique to him, and it's, but, but as human beings, we're not simply individuals. We born in community and we live in community. We are social in our nature. And that all human beings, and in some of his more recent writings, uh, Fratelli Tutti, where he talks about the oneness of the human family, that sense of all of us are 
deep down in relationship with each other. And sometimes when you see documents, for example, coming out of more secular sources, they talk about the radical interdependence of human beings. So therefore, people have to make choices knowing that they live in a world in which there are others, okay? But it's almost like a reluctant having to accept that rather than an embracing of that as something positive. We live in this world, we live as brothers and sisters, the choices we make have impact, have importance for ourselves, but they have importance for others. And Pope Francis has this then, the sense of, particularly if we look to the problems of our world, and this emerges very strongly in his teaching, which is much more articulated than his teaching on AI, but his teaching on environmental issues, where he makes it very clear that the world is going to have to confront the question of the environment, drawing on all the resources that it has, drawing on the different human traditions. The word he most frequently uses in that document is the word dialogue. So in encountering AI, in meeting AI, if as a human society, if as human beings we're going to do that appropriately, we need to do it in dialogue and in engagement with each other. Because as that idea, as we say, is we are interpersonal by nature. That means we have to be able to, and if you think about it, if we're confronting the reality of the AI, it's a global reality, we're going to have to be able to, as a human race, find points of agreement on which we can work to ensure that this new technology will serve the interests of our world and of all of us. So therefore, the encounter feature is that I see others as sources of richness, sources of wisdom, as having something more to add to my understanding of what it is to be human. So Pope Francis, particularly in the document on human fraternity, develops a whole approach to ethical and moral thinking, which says, what is it to be human? It is that the, the background of which we against, against which we make ethical choices and ethical judgments is rooted in our understanding of what it is to be human. Our understanding of what it is to be human is always shaped by our own culture, religious and philosophical backgrounds. But if we're to have a comprehensive and richer understanding of what it is to be human, we need to meet others, encounter others, understand their perspectives, see what they have to say as a richness. So we try to find our way in a world that is increasingly polarized, where we tend to exclude those who disagree with us, where we tend to listen only to those who affirm our positions, and where that is also then forced upon us at Tom Sands by algorithms, where we're forced into our little ghettos. Pope Francis has this idea that, no, we need to encounter, we need to go beyond our own safe limits and meet those who may come with different perspectives so that the solutions we develop to our shared human problems are solutions that are nourished by the richness of the variety and diversity of human experience. Just listening to everything that you were saying, I've always thought that irrespective of how many layers of technology there's there in front of us, like right now, for example, through like Zoom, like the Zoom layer and the internet layer and every single layer, it, it's always about this encountering that you're talking about. It's always about the other human being, the, the human being at the other side. And I, I just I think it's uh it's a it's a wonderful it's a wonderful concept. And you also mentioned um you know about finding different points of agreement, and I think that's a very interesting, of course, both on a personal level but also on a language level. Because I think one of the great issues that we have with artificial intelligence is precisely the definition of terms. Not only those terms used in the discipline itself, but rather the terms used to define it, such as intelligence, right? There's always this discussion about what intelligence means. And I think that actually the book has, uh, the, the book analyzes this concept of intelligence. And there's certainly a, a very, it's, it's a deep analysis of that concept. And, you know, basically saying that intelligence is a lot more than just a simple procedure, that it requires, I quote, experiential engagement, which is part of what you are saying right now, that understanding as procedure without a co-penetrating understanding as apprehension, is, is, which is kind of like the view of computationalism, should not be equaled to intelligence. So one of the, I think, the, one of the, the, the toughest or one of the greatest challenges that we have in front of us is, is precisely the language itself, artificial intelligence. Intelligence. So I don't know, perhaps you can tell us a bit more about like how this view of experiential engagement related to intelligence is rooted in the teachings of the church 
and how applying it to it, uh, applying it to current AI can change our perspective on what AI really is and also on what humans really are. We should just uh, touched on that point. Yeah, I th- picked that point from two perspectives. One is that I think I think you're correct. When people begin talking about artificial intelligence, there may be an immediate presumption that we know what we mean by intelligence. <laughs> Whereas what we're asking people to think about is what do we? What is a distinctively human intelligence? Okay, because if we see intelligence simply about problem solving or computational capacities, okay, I think that's a somewhat limited understanding of what human intelligence is at its best. Human intelligence is also not something that is impersonal. Our human intelligence, and I think um, we become more and more aware of this, is we have to avoid a type of dualism where intelligence is just this kind of abstract intellectual ability which somehow is added on to a human person and makes him or her human. Our intelligence is rooted in our organic natures, our awareness of ourselves as organic, our awareness of ourselves as being in relationship with others, that we're not disembodied in any sense, and that we have a sense of when we make calculations and when we um, try and solve problems, we have a sense of our own engagement with that, our own choices in that, our own involvement, that it's not something that is impersonal. And therefore, I think what we're trying to understand is to protect an understanding of intelligence that goes beyond the simply functional or the computational. And I'm not to devalue the importance of computational intelligence or problem solving, but they are very, very important, but they need to be contextualized in a broader human context of asking questions about what are the problems we're trying to solve? Why are we trying to solve them? Where do they they fit together with other perspectives? So one of the things I would say that that is, is that is precisely opening up that understanding of what it is to be a human person is that sense of a consciousness, awareness of myself, awareness of myself, even as I perform um, operations that of intelligence. Yeah, and and I think that um, precisely this kind of the, the fact that it's personal, it's it's embodied. It's as, as you're saying, it's not disembodied. It has to be put within the human context. It's part of what actually uh, uh, makes the the topic itself so uh, interesting. In the end, it's people. It, we're in a in a world of people, right? It's people talking to each other. It's people. Yeah. Um, it's it's a world of people. So irrespective of how many uh, how many tech inventions or how many computers or how many anything in the end it's a world of people i was just remembering that recently and i had put this forward before at some point in uh, some other conversations because i'm a musician so at some point people were telling me like are you worried about ai performing the piano or something i was like well not really because pianolas for example pianos that play themselves have existed for a a very long time and people have never been (laughs) excited about it it's about the other person it's about that relationship but now you really also um, mentioning something very important at the beginning, I think, which is that AI is something that's there that's going to impact everyone, to have an impact on everyone. And uh, these different conversations that we're having, like the one we're having right now, or the ones that you have with um, other uh, people and with scholars, and, you know, conversations can be held at several levels. But, you know, in kind of like, if you walk on the street and, and get the feeling of kind of like everyday people that perhaps are not as involved either on the AI world or on the um theology or uh, philosophy world, there's kind of like this feeling about sometimes it's about people being scared of AI or things like that, right? And what I'm trying to say is that the church, for example, for thousands of years has been, uh, it's it, it remains close to everyday people. And I think there's a, uh, people right now, nowadays, are kind of like complaining a lot about several world institutions like the UN or other institutions, for example, that they feel, I mean, I'm not saying that's the case, I'm just saying that's the feeling of people, that they're not really close to them. And one of the great challenges, I think, that we have is precisely regarding language and the complexity of the concepts that we're just talking about right now, for example. So I guess the question with that is the church being very close to uh, to people on an everyday basis, how can the church provide guidance in the era of artificial intelligence, not to the world leaders, but rather to the millions of people that have some sort of anxiety about what AI is going to bring to the world? I think the first thing is, I think 
When I think of the church and its engagement in this area, I think particularly of our, my own, uh, the Catholic Church, with which I'm most familiar, which has an extraordinary range of educational institutions globally. And I think one of the areas where I think we can help people is by creating a better awareness. Um, I think there are issues where, and one of the projects that we're hoping to move on from here is to, I work in the Department of Culture and Education. The culture side, we focus on trying to understand what it is to be human, what it is that makes human life worthwhile, what it is that gives meaning and purpose to human life. We want people to realize that among the things that give purpose and meaning to life is their capacity to relate to others, their capacity to be intentional in how they deal with others, their, their choice, their freedom to engage with others in different ways. Our educational institutions, apart from giving people education in terms of instruction and skills and disciplines, are also about forming people and helping them to have a sense of purpose and meaning in their lives. Formation of people to a way of living that is more meaningful. Within those institutions, I think we need to think, and I think all education institutions need to think about, what is education going to look like in a world where AI is a very real presence? Are we going to see AI as something with which we can work? The, I think I heard people talking as the, as the co-pilot model. AI will be able to do many things much more quickly than we as human beings can do them. It can process information. It can look through archives. It can spot patterns and connections. It can analyze medical data, okay? What is it that the human being will be able to bring to that? I think something about the purposing of that, the directionality of that, and it's something also about the evaluation of that, the fix it, fitting it into the bigger human picture. So how do we give human beings the confidence to know that we will need to make the choices about the type of world we want, about the type of values we want to promote, about the type of relationships that are going to be meaning for human beings, and how can we see the potential of AI and other forms of machine learning to help us to do that better. So that it's somehow about trying to ensure that the direction of AI, the focus of the research, where it will be applied, will be ultimately held and made accountable to human and democratic structures. So part of what the church will be trying to do is to human being, to, to people is say, let's not just Let's take an interest in this. Let's understand this. Let's not be frightened of this, but let's make sure that we bring our concerns into appropriate forums. So it's somehow trying to make sure that AI will be held, or at least those who develop AI, will be able to make it accountable to human beings. I mean, one of the great things is everybody wants AI to be, we see the language all the time, human-centric, it's to be person-centered, it's to be at the service of the good of all. And these are noble aspirations. But how do we ensure that there is, that they, they go beyond the points of simply aspirations and really are serving the benefits of all human beings? So if we think of a, an, an obvious ethical one at the moment is, the future of work. AI could displace certain types of work and employment. That is, is going to be significant for the people who lose their jobs. Losing your job is not just about simply losing your income. It's about losing your, your social environment, your sense of your dignity and your worth, your sense of engagement with things. Some of the work that may be displaced may be no loss. Maybe machines can do it quicker, and it's somewhat it's impersonal work. But how do we ensure that human beings are not simply paid off with some sort of a social benefit that's going to keep them going and keep them quiet, but that their precise human skills, values, attitudes, and talents will be valued and will be used? So it's how do we think about who is going to have the ultimate control over how AI develops and how it is shaped? And I think part of what the church would want to do is, however naively, to get away from either people are so frightened that they react against, 
to people are thinking that this is going to be so good, it'll do it, it'll resolve all its own problems. How do we find a way that people know and understand enough what the issues are to be able to hold political leaders and business leaders accountable for how they will, in reality, shape the future of AI? Yeah, and, and I think, you know, now with Matt, now that I was uh, listening to, to what you were saying, there are several challenges, um, which, I mean, I, I think the, the approach regarding edu education is certainly wonderful because that's, I think, the answer to very many of the issues that we're facing, not only in, in this particular field, but also in others like sustainable development and many other uh, of the great challenges I think that the world is facing. But there's something which I think, I mean, education, it's and one of the challenges, at least from, from my perspective, is that education, I mean, it is a way that it is, right? It takes time and, and it's great that it takes time because it's the way that human beings grow. But sometimes the overall narrative uh, of how fast technology is moving, sort of like, you know, people talk about how quickly education needs to be adapted. It is like, well, technology might be moving very quickly, but human beings are still human beings and human beings still need time. And it's great that they need time because that's precisely the experience that uh, that one you know has while learning new things and while being in a broader context that you were saying also related to jobs. It's not just about a source of income. It's about a social environment. It's about so much more. And this narrative, I think, actually, um, Pope Francis was uh, touching on this uh, narrative, uh, you know, that the, the concept of limit is somehow um, overlooked in this uh, technocratic and efficiency-oriented mentality, which I think has to do precisely with that narrative. So I... What are the main challenges, like throughout these different approaches that you mentioned regarding education and regarding kind of like the let's understand this, let's not be afraid of it. Uh, what are the main challenges that the church sees in front and how are you addressing those challenges in conveying these messages to people? Yeah, I would say that the more articulated statements of the church leadership have been directed more to trying to draw the attention of um, those who are already working in the field, who are already developing it. They, the efforts have been there to try and create awareness among those people about their responsibilities. The next step, I think, is to try and create, if I could use the parallel to the um, environmental area is to create a constituency of people who understand the issues and who have enough knowledge and awareness that this is something I need to reflect on because it impacts on my future and on the future of our world. Okay, how do we educate people to feel that they have enough knowledge and enough resources and enough understanding of what's coming to understand that they need to engage with those issues? Obviously, that becomes an issue, and I see this already happening to some extent. It's quite interesting. If you look at where there have been very significant responses to the ethical issues raised by AI, we have the level of um, governments and intergovernmental fora trying to create frameworks and disciplines and regulation around AI. We have companies trying to develop best practices and principles to guide AI. One of the more interesting areas have been individuals in their own conscience making decisions not to engage with certain types of research that they see as damaging for human beings and damaging for our human future. So I think where the church will have a particular role because we can contribute to the global discussion, we can help companies if, through our through the engagement of believers to create but it's also about yes encouraging individuals to make ethical choices that are consistent with their deepest value systems and that's where i see hope it's been quite interesting to see a number of people in silicon valley who have refused to work on certain types of applications of ai to warfare systems and um, people who are less content to work. And I think that, and often at a cost to themselves, who are raising questions about the appropriateness, say, of the business models used in social media companies, how we encourage people to take that ethical lead. One of the interesting, and it's it's a kind of, a, it's some of your, the people that may have, I read a thing recently, uh, David Eggers is a writer I like. He wrote, a book that suddenly became the film called The Circle, and then there was a following one called The Every, which is about the emergence of a type of artificial intelligence 
that brings together all the social media companies we have and all the systems we have. And all the time, people are being alerted to the freedom they're losing by engaging with these systems. But constantly, people are seem to be willing to trade off but convenience for freedom and for control. So human beings, in a sense, give up their own responsibilities, give up their own sense of freedom, their own sense of autonomy to fit into a world that is created around um, technological systems. So I think that's what I would be trying to encourage in people is that awareness to what's happening, awareness to what the dangers may be for us as human beings. For example, if our notion of, our, of intelligence is to be defined by the type of intelligence that machines can achieve, computational abilities and problem solving, then the risk is we sacrifice something of the human understanding of intelligence about intentionality, about freedom, about our own engagement. If we look at the area about what makes us precisely human, it's that capacity to relate with another person whose freedom is part of who they are. An AI system will only be valuable to me insofar as it does what I want it to do. Whereas a human person often is that the most important and most significant is when they challenge me when they don't give me what I'm looking for immediately. And I'm maybe somewhat overstating it here, but if I were teaching today, I think, you know, a lot of people have this fear about could AI systems, could the machines become human? I think the real risk is could humans become machines? But the only types of knowledge, the only types of intelligence, the only types of functions that will be appreciated are those that can be performed by machines which will lose out on something of the human genius of creativity, the human genius of love, the human genius of self-giving. And you know, this this last part that you just said about like people becoming more more like machines, it just reminded me a lot that not long ago, actually, someone asked me uh, whether I was afraid that people, uh, that machines were going to actually become more intelligent than people. And I was telling them that I was more afraid of people becoming a bit lazy because of machines yeah. and precisely losing all this that you're talking about, which was, I think that's, a, you know, I was like, that's, that's the fear. And also with what you said regarding like, you know, AI brings the most value where, when, when it actually does what you tell it to do. And in the case of people, it's like when they actually kind of like challenge you and, you know, all these different things. I was also, it, it's also very interesting because, because people talk about like, oh, what if this becomes uh, conscious or something and then it rules over the world. And I was like, well, if it becomes conscious, probably the first thing it's going to do is ask for holidays because it's working 24 seven, the AI, and you know, it's just that. And I think Sorry, that issue about, you've touched there about what if it becomes conscious. I think the richer notion of consciousness that we want to develop, that we develop in our paper, is not something that a machine could achieve. Certainly, and I don't yeah. think I'm trying to protect. I don't think it's a speciesism that I'm somehow trying to protect something that keeps us different from machines. I think it's part of the mystery of who we are, and that we need to value those um, capacities. I think what is it makes us human, and I think of couple of seminars I attended, one where there was a great insight that part of the thing is human vulnerability, that we're willing at times, apart from our own inherent fragility, our inherent weakness, we are at times willing to become vulnerable through choice by caring about another person, about caring about an issue, and that that is what makes us human. It's not a calculation. It's mm -hmm. much more a giving of ourselves, and in that capacity, so you think of the love of a parent for a child who's difficult, that love will make them vulnerable. Sometimes you might say, close it off, you know, cut them out of your life, move on, they're only going to bring you trouble. But something about the choice to be vulnerable because of the choice to love and not to give up on another person, that goes beyond any focused calculation and makes us precisely human, okay? I think these are the sort of things that we need to promote and value. 
Yeah, a hundred percent. And there were so many, uh, I mean, within the book, there are so many great concepts and, and I certainly agree with you with what you were saying regarding um, consciousness and everything else. I, I think that, and I will, I mean, there's so many things that we uh, can talk about this, but I, I think I'll use this time to actually encourage people to read the book, to download the book, because it's yeah. just a wonderful, it's a wonderful material. It's just so great to actually really to go deep into all these concepts. And I'm sure that everyone here will enjoy that uh, as much as I did. And uh, please read the book. As a last question of my own, can you tell us something a bit, you know, how you envision, you personally envision this future? Uh, one last thought, perhaps, about how things, uh, how you want things to play out uh, in the next, I don't know, in the next few years. Yes, well, also at, at my age, I'm not looking to a very long term future. <laughs> but no, I do see, um, I see excitement and great potentials in AI and in things that it will be able to do for us if it's properly harnessed. Um, I think one of the things that I think that I, even if one thinks of to what issues will AI be, in which, in which fields will AI be deployed? And I think one of the things we need to be, and Pope Francis is very strong on this, is we need to be very attentive to ensuring that it's not the logic of the market and the logic of a consumerist economy that decides where AI will be deployed. Um, I think that requires us to have a much stronger sense of um, how we ensure that these extraordinary paths, and they are limited in their own ways, because uh, it's not as if the cloud is something that is, you know, unlimited. We're, there's a choice of resources that makes intelligence, artificial intelligence possible. And I think there's a responsibility to ensure then that those resources are put into purposes that offer human benefit. So therefore, my hope is to see AI being employed in looking for better understanding of complex systems such as weather systems, food production systems, human health analysis. I see great potential there, guided by the proper questions to offer us support and help. My worries a little bit are more that, and I think I can see it somehow, is that AI becomes something because it increasingly will push wealth into fewer and fewer hands, will fracture the real sense of human solidarity. This is something Pope Francis has come back to occasionally, which is the question that, is our world going to become more divided with a smaller number of people having increased material benefits, but those same material benefits giving them increased political power and sometimes even losing the sense of the destiny, the shared destiny of human beings. Are we going to use AI for to address difficult human issues here among us now? Or are we going to set up kind of delightfully futuristic scientific projects that will be there for the few? Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bishop Paul Tai. Thank you so much. It's been a true honor. It's been a true honor to have you here. Your uh, answers have been wonderful, and I, I'm sure that everyone here has found them just as interesting as, as, as myself. And this part that you said about not losing that shared destiny, we're all here in the same world. So thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a true honor to have you here. The wisdom that you've shared with us has clearly left a, a big mark on each one of us. It's Pablo, can I just say that I kind of feel a little bit of a fraud because the real work on this has been done by the extraordinary range of people who worked on this project. We convened them, we brought them together, but I would have never imagined that it would be as productive as this has been. And I really want to name the authors, the writers, and all those who contributed so much to this process. And um, I'm not going to name anyone because there's so many, if I just name one or two, it'll be invidious. But this, would, this is something that I honestly think, when we began the calling of people together, we had no idea that it would end up with something that I think has a very substantive richness. Um, I should say there are the layers there from the human to the quite technological, and it's a tribute to um, an extraordinary generous range of authors who have done this collaboratively. And I just want to acknowledge that more than anything. Of course, thank you. Thank you so much, Bishop, certainly.
You just listened to the AI and Fate recording from January 2024. Stay tuned to listen to more recordings and interviews with experts from around the world. In the meantime, follow and rate our new podcast on your favorite podcast platform and share with your friends. Don't forget to follow us on our social media as well. We are on LinkedIn and X. Thank you for joining us today.